The unicorn is a mythical animal celebrated in many cultures of the world. In Europe, it was first mentioned in the 5th century BCE by a Greek physician, and the animal has become one of the most beloved subjects in art and literature. The unicorn tapestries at the cloisters consist of six large hangings, some measuring 12 by 12 feet, and two small fragments from an original that was damaged. Together, they represent different stages of a hunt with details corresponding to those in medieval hunting manuals. On this tapestry called the start of the hunt, a group of handsomely attired hunting party walks into the woods. Do you see a young man waving at the upper right hand corner? Might he have spotted the unicorn? Despite the fame and extensive research, little is known about the early history of these tapestries. Thanks to the fashion so meticulously rendered, we can date these tapestries to around the turn of the 16th century. And the overall design is unquestionably French. Throughout the tapestries, we find this cipher, a letter A tied by a knotted cord to a reversed E. You see it hanging on the tree above the heads of the three hunters in the center of the composition. At the four corners, even decorating the colors of the dogs. The cipher must allude to the original owners, alas, their identity remains unknown. We do know that by 1680, these tapestries had belonged to François VI de la Rochefoucauld. In fact, except for about 50 years, they remain in the family's possession until they were purchased by John D. Rockefeller Jr., who later gave them to the cloisters. In 1938, when the cloisters opened, the six large tapestries occupied a long wall, three long walls in a long gallery seen on the left. This original space was later reconfigured into two contiguous galleries. The larger of the two became the unicorn tapestry room as we know it today, seen on the right. The gallery provides a historically appropriate setting to experience the unicorn tapestries. We can actually see the unicorn purifies water the subject of today's program in the back of the image on the right. Let me now welcome Barbara and Amelia to speak about this splendid tapestry. Thank you, Nancy. Here in The Unicorn Purifies Water, we see hunters gathered around a hidden garden in the middle of a forest. Although their hunt has just begun, they are stopped in their tracks because they have found their prey, the elusive unicorn. But they are shocked and amazed because the unicorn is not alone, but he is surrounded by his fellow animals. Several different species of animals can be seen gathered here, some which could be found in nature in 16th century Europe, but some that would have been labeled as exotic. And these exotic animals would be the lion, the panther, the hyena that you see in the foreground. And while these animals would have been labeled as exotic, that did not mean that they were entirely unfamiliar to Europeans. Medieval kings and queens kept royal menageries, and these menageries would have been filled with animals um, from all over the world and were sometimes given as diplomatic gifts between rulers. So a visitor could come to a royal menagerie and see lions and leopards from Africa, camels from the Middle East, and sometimes even porcupines from India. And there's this great story that we have. Um, Charles V of France had such a royal menagerie. And when Prince Wenceslas visited Paris in 1378, and he was taken on this grand tour of the city, in all of Paris, the thing he was most excited to see was the lions at Charles V's menagerie. And medieval writers, like royalty, were absolutely fascinated by animals. Bestiaries explained that the, um, when the lion senses a hunter nearby, he would use his tail to wipe away his paw prints. And the panther, it was written, um, had this very fragrant breath, the sweet smelling breath, 
and the panther would open his mouth and use his sweet smelling breath to attract other animals to him. And while bestiaries written according to the medieval Christian tradition um, would compare the lion, king of all animals, to Christ, king of all creation. Other writers would use these very same animals to create metaphors of courtly love. So in Richard de Forneval's Bestiary of Love, written in the 13th century, love itself is compared to the bold and rash lion and the attracting, sweet-smelling breath of the panther is compared to the captivating allure of a lover. And these texts were incredibly popular in the Middle Ages, and thus they were fully ingrained into medieval thought and culture. So we saw this menagerie gathered in the foreground of the tapestry. But surrounding this gathering at the fountain, we see several hunting dogs. Hunting was a noble pastime in the Middle Ages, but it was also a serious enterprise. Like other trades, boys would become uh, hunting apprentices at a very young age. And one of the first things required of them as a hunting apprentice is they would have to be able to distinguish between the different types of hunting dogs. And they would even have to memorize the names of these hunting dogs. And in this tapestry, we have two of the five types of medieval hunting dogs depicted. In the image on the left, you see the limer. This was the dog used to scent out, scent out the prey. And he's pulling on his leash, um, desperately wanting to get closer to that lion. And on the right, you see greyhounds, and these were the dogs used to chase the prey. And um, in this image on the right, they are waiting patiently by their master's side, almost asking permission to attack. And that these dogs are domesticated and trained is marked by their elaborate collars of red and blue. During this period, dog collars were actually used as a symbol or marker of a dog owner's wealth. And so in 1420, Philip the Good, Duke of Burgundy, actually commissioned a collar for one of his greyhounds that was made of crimson velvet and bore his coat of arms in gold. And his family motto was even embroidered on the collar in pearls. But the unicorn's inclusion amongst this gathering of animals tells us that the medieval, the medieval viewer accepted and believed that the unicorn was a real animal. There are no griffins or dragons in this tapestry. So by placing the unicorn amongst real animals such as the lion, the stag, the panther, the artist is giving us a glimpse into the medieval worldview of nature. To the medieval person, the unicorn was just as real as the other animals seen here. Over to you, Barbara. So just how do the artists responsible for this tapestry, the weavers, the designer, convince us that this magical kingdom actually exists? Well, in part, by providing us with crucial, convincing detail. I think we can see that if we look together at these two animals. And you see right away that these guys are thirsty. Their mouths are open. We can see their tongues. The panther on the left has a kind of desperate look. Not only is his mouth open, his eyes are bulging, his nostrils are slightly flaring, and his hair is standing on it. As to the hyena, He's living up to his reputation as a kind of mad dog. Again, ears are pert. He's straining forward with his neck. His eyes are bulging too. He has these huge kind of lashes around his eyes. His nose is tipped up. And he's standing on these knobbly legs. If you look beyond his knobbly legs, you see his abdomen. And suddenly we realize not only is this guy thirsty, he's hungry. He has not been eating well because you can see his ribs. Now, how does the artist do that? Well, 
the weaver uses very subtle technique. Uh, it's called hatching in the case of the, of the ribs of his abdomen. In that kind of relentless procession over, under, over, under, that characterizes tapestry weaving, the weaver stops and introduces just a little bit of wool yarn of a slightly different color, a little bit deeper brown, to define each of those ribs. And the point where it stops sets the beginning of each of those four ribs that you see. So they're waiting here at the water's edge. Let's look at the water itself. Behind the panther, the water is smooth, almost like a mirror, and it has a shallow bank and plants growing right up to the edge of the bank. This is the place that if you were walking there, your feet would start to squish in the soft ground and your shoes would likely come up muddy, right? That's the place where the panther is. Just a little farther downstream, where the hyena is, the water is completely different. Now, just beyond the point where the unicorn's horn has dipped in the water, we have these little waves, these little rivulets, and the water becomes very active. And again, this is done by very subtle techniques on the part of the weaver. You might call it sleight of hand almost. Uh, and it's so convincing that it causes not only the animals, but perhaps even ourselves in looking at it, to feel just a little bit thirsty. So who's directing traffic here? The weaver worked from a full-size design called a cartoon, likely done in linen, maybe only with inks, show ink to show where the figures are, and sometimes painted in color. There, there are very, very few that actually survive and none survives for our tapestry. <laughs> but we do also have contracts with the various artists who were uh, responsible for tapestries, and those spell out the terms, how long it's going to take, what's the subject to be painted, and what the payment is going to be. And you may be amused to know that payment was, of course, often in coin, and sometimes in a combination of coin and French wine, which is probably not a bad deal either. I think that you can see something of the relationship of a cartoon to a tapestry. If we look not at a cartoon, we don't have the cartoon, but rather at a woodcut uh, that was done for a printed Bible in Paris around 1500. And it is attributed to an artist whose name is Jean Dupre. He's a member of a family of painters and very likely responsible for this particular design. Now, if you look at it, I think you can see a number of points in common with our tapestry. So, at the, uh, at the left of Adam, you see a stag, and that stag is the mirror twin, in a different scale, of the stag in our tapestry. And then at the very front, you see, uh, next to the feet of Eve, you see a gene, this kind of elegant looking weasel, there is such a thing as an elegant weasel, um, which again is the twin in reverse to the one who's standing at next to our panther in the tapestry. But beyond that, I would like to look with you at the way the fountain is shown, because I think there you can see what is happening on the weaver's part beyond what is already in the design of a woodcut or a cartoon. Even in the woodcut, you can see that at the point where the water falls in and um, hits the bowl of the, of the fountain, that it causes little concentric circles. And that is achieved in the weaving as well. But look how much more subtle it is in the rendering of the tapestry. Now, how does the weaver achieve that? What is the weaver capable of doing and what technical option is open to the weaver that was not open for the woodcut? Well, I'm going to tell you that what the weaver has done is to bring the power of gravity to bear in the creation of this tapestry. That probably sounds absurd, but it's not. So again, when the weaver is going along over, under, over, under, he's going to break the rules for a moment. 
Now, I say he. Most tapestry weavers that we know from the records were men. There are some women who are active as entrepreneurs in the tapestry industry, and it did become virtual industry. Um, in general, those are either the wives, the widows, or sometimes the daughters of master weavers. So this weaver is going along, bringing, in this case, wool threads from two sides. And as they approach each other over, under, over, under, they meet at a weft. But now, instead of crossing them over, which will help the tapestry hold together, it's just going to allow them to touch, but not cross. Knowing that when the tapestry ultimately is turned and suspended from a wall, that gravity itself will cause just the slightest pull and that space that is created between those two bits of wool will make the, will leave the impression of a shadow or of a line. So the equivalent of the engraved lines, but much more subtly done. And so effectively done in place after place in this small area that it goes way beyond what happens in the woodcut. Look, there's even a splash. Do you see that? As the water falls down and hits the surface of the pool, it causes a splash to erupt. Absolutely amazing. And it's even better because as the pheasant leans forward to dip its nose into the its beak into the water, there's its reflection picked out in just a few colored yarns. It's simply exquisite. Back to you, Amelia, for the flowers. As we saw earlier with the depiction of animals, and now in the flora, the flowers, the trees, the artists of these tapestries were acutely observing nature when creating these artworks. They were aware of the world around them and studied that world to produce this tapestry. The plants depicted in the unicorn tapestries were sometimes chosen because they, like the animals, held some deeper meaning. But most of the time they were chosen simply because they were beautiful. And in fact, the artists of these tapestries rendered the plants so accurately that in all seven of the unicorn tapestries, 101 individual species of plants can be recognized. And here in the unicorn purifies water, 11 different flowers, herbs, and trees can be identified by name. And seven of those 11 are actually grown in the gardens at the cloisters. Some of the plants depicted here were believed to be antidotes against poison. Pot marigold and sage, both commonly grown in medieval gardens, um, were both believed to have this curative power to, to cure poison, to be an antidote to poison. And so in an herbal book from 1525, it is written that if you soak sage in ale or wine and then drink this concoction, you will be healed of your ills. And healing, as Barbara will discuss in a few minutes, is a major theme of this tapestry. A book of flower studies, a contemporary work to the unicorn tapestries, and recently acquired by the Met, also shows how artists of this period are closely observing nature to create their art artworks. Here are two pages from the book. On the left, we see a painting of pansies and on the right, a painting of pot marigolds. Let's take a closer look at the pansy. Here, um, the artist has delicately um, painted a dragonfly, uh, which is perched daintily on the stem of the pansy and it has translucent wings. And there's a soft shadow behind the flower as if a light was shining directly on the flower while they painted it. 
And in the Middle Ages, um, the pansy was associated with love and remembrance. The English name pansy actually derived from the French word pensée to think. And below here, you see um, the woven equivalents of these flowers in the tapestry itself. And this tapestry really demonstrates how art and nature are woven together. And this close relationship between nature and art is on display at the cloisters itself. At the cloisters, galleries look out onto tended gardens. The Cloisters has three gardens, Bonifant Tree and the Judy Black Garden in the Kusha Cloister. And here, um, flowers and plants and herbs that were indigenous to medieval Europe are grown here in the Cloisters gardens. And several of the plants grown in these gardens can actually be found in the unicorn tapestries. So within the, the, within the confines of the cloisters, its galleries and its gardens, as in the unicorn tapestries, the boundary between art and nature, real and imagined, is blurred. And as we saw with that careful rendering of plants in the tapestries, medieval, the medieval artists and viewers of these tapestries had a heightened sense of nature they were in awe of and intensely aware of their natural surroundings. And I believe for most of us, or at least me personally, we have become more aware of nature since the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic. For me, it took being confined in my small New York City apartment to appreciate the nature that I can see from my window. So I watched the tree across the street go from leafless in March to blossoming in April and May. And I've been greeted on my windowsill by pigeons and doves. And in the evenings, I climb out onto my fire escape and watch bats fly over the tops of buildings. So I think now more than ever, we can look at these tapestries afresh and we can learn something from the medieval artists of these tapestries and the viewers of these tapestries. The medieval audiences that enjoyed these tapestries fully understood the abundance and the importance of nature to their society and to their world. It was in nature that they found meaning, healing, beauty, and truth. Over to you, Barbara. Beauty and healing are entwined in the tapestries and encoded in centuries of belief. In Nancy's introduction, she mentioned a Greek doctor who wrote about the unicorn. And that doctor, who was also an historian, who spoke of Persia and India, averred that the unicorn had the capability to purify water and to rid water of poison. But no wonder people were so eager to hunt this poor beast. Imagine a world when that was all it took, a magic horn to provide clean water. There would be no outbreaks of cholera in the world. There would be no shameful contamination of tap water in Flint, Michigan. There would be no necessity to fly in water from the Fiji Islands to sell in the United States, all by virtue of a unicorn. Our forebears recognized around the world in a way that we still struggle to, that pure water is a natural resource of inestimable value. I don't say that based only on this tapestry and the look of these slightly stunned men and boys. This was something that was uh, a common thread in medieval literature, in medical and pharmaceutical writings, and in tapestries that we know existed, but which we no longer have. So if we were to look at the household inventories, the lists of possessions of members of the nobility and the merchant classes in France at the beginning of the 16th century, 
we would find that there are a number of mentions of tapestries representing the unicorn purifying water. There was one in the possession of Louis of Luxembourg at the end of the 15th century. And there was one in the chateau that belonged to a woman called Charlotte d'Abre, who had the, uh, she was the unhappy wife of a rather, uh, a rather nasty member of the Borgia family. And uh, in addition, there's a drawing of one that survives still today, um, that comes from a collection of drawings made for a gentleman called Francois Roberté. Francois Roberté belonged to a merchant class family in Paris who had, that had become avid patrons of the arts. And here you see the subject, which you'll surely recognize by now, that's the same as our tapestry. Here, the unicorn tips up on his hind legs in order to drink from uh, a deep fountain. And he's clearly on a mission to purify that water, which must have been poisoned by the snake who slithers away from the edge of the fountain. Around him, as on our tapestries, is gathered a selection of animals, and again, a slightly odd combination of animals. At the front left, there's a baby elephant with an inordinately long trunk that is almost worthy of Dr. Seuss. And on the opposite bank, something that might be an armadillo uh, close to a pair of sheep. Up close to the unicorn, up by the fountain, are three animals, a stag with great antlers, a horse, and what might be a juvenile unicorn. This combination of animals, who all resemble to a certain extent the unicorn itself, seems to be there as if the artist is telling us, look, isn't a unicorn the most logical of animals? looks so much like a stag, so much like a horse, just a different style of antler. It's as if hundreds of years before Darwin, the artist is putting the unicorn into its logical classification system. To give you a sense of just how ubiquitous this uh, notion of the unicorn purifying water is, uh, I'm showing you at the left, uh, and uh, a linen made in Italy in the 16th century, a, a band that shows this time paired unicorns, paired unicorns working together to zap the water in fountain uh, time and again, one, two, three across the band that we have. It becomes almost a decorative motif, which might cause you to wonder, well, is this something people really took seriously or is this just a playful, notion at this time. To demonstrate that it wasn't just a playful notion, on the right you see a covered cup, a covered drinking vessel, almost a vial in its shape. <clears throat> and on the top is a unicorn who is proclaiming that this uh, is in fact a unicorn beaker. And if you look at the ivory section in the middle, you can see that characteristic twist of the ivory, which uh, identifies it as unicorn horn. Now, if you were to ask yourself, wait a minute, couldn't that section of horn in fact be the tooth of that Arctic mammal known as a narwhal? There's a clear evidence here for you, a clear testament that that is not the case because just above the foot of the cup, just where you would put your hand to pick it up to drink it, is the silhouette of the unicorn. Do you see it in low relief there? There's your evidence. This is a unicorn cup. I hope you can see why this is my favorite of the Cloister's Unicorn Tapestries. It has a, an exceptional kind of poetry and elegance to it. The prophet Isaiah famously wrote of the lion and the lamb lying down peaceably together. Actually, the better translation is the wolf and the lamb, but it comes to the same thing. Here, it's not just two animals. It's a number of animals who don't necessarily get along in normal circumstances. And men who might be after them, but who are 
stopped here, dead in their tracks, just as the animals are, because they're all witnessing a quiet kind of miracle. What wouldn't we give in our day to be going through the wood and to stumble upon a cure for our ills, thanks to the gift of a beautiful, uh, peaceful creature like a unicorn. I hope you'll come soon when the cloisters reopens to see this tapestry. And in the meantime, I thank you for your attention today.